right? All of these are immune conjugates or somehow immune or antibody related. But of course, we also have a new uh, and approved cytotoxic, and that is, is of course, vincristine, liposomal vincristine, Marquibo. What's your experience with that? So this is a very interesting drug because uh, it goes back to the question of vincristine. Uh, vincristine is, is being used for about 40 years. Uh, it has single agent activity, but it's never used as a single agent. Uh, it's used in lymphomas. It's always used in CLL. Uh, the problem with it, you can't escalate the dose above uh, two milligrams for reasons that we don't know. Uh, and, and therefore, we cannot know what is the impact of vincristine in a combination of chemotherapy when you use it with other drugs. Now, uh, 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 the, uh, liposomal vincristine, is it's, it's vincristine in, in, inside a, a, a liposome which releases it slowly, and then you can deliver much higher concentrations of, of, of vincristine and uh, overcome the barrier of these uh, two milligrams. So in the studies that has been reported, it was able to deliver two to four-fold more uh, than Christine. And now you can really start studying if escalating the doses of Christine uh, can have uh, an effect. One of the major, uh, I would say, uh, if one of the important uh, facts about the Christine is it, or the liposomal Christine, it works as a single agent. And, and that moves Christine from its combination with other drugs and using it as a single agent. And actually, that's how it's been approved. Right, they have an approval in uh, second relapse, advanced stage, yeah. single agent on the basis of an unmet medical need. So we have one drug that's FDA approved in an unmet medical need. We have three or four drugs that are being targeted in a relapsed refractory setting. So anybody on the panel have some ideas where these might be utilized to improve the outcome of patients, adult patients, with newly diagnosed ALL. I mean, one, of, one of the real exciting things that if you're in practice, you think about the chimeric antigen receptor T cells, and that sort of was something that was you know, obtained at an academic center only and was not going to be, it was going to be a boutique type therapy. And the exciting thing you know, with the CAR-19 therapy that's coming out of the University of Pennsylvania is that it's been commercialized and it's being developed to be extended out to phase three studies where hopefully many patients with ALL are gonna be able to receive it from a, a centralized product. And it's gonna become, become a therapy that you know, probably rapidly moves through phase three studies. And you know, it really has, in, in, from the early data at least, the potential to you know, extend a prolonged remission that you only really see with transplant in adult ALL patients you know, to this population. If, you know, if the early data hold up. Because so you, you don't think then that the cytokine release syndrome of the CARS or the uh, infusion-related uh, status epilepticus of ablinitumumab would be in, in any way inhibiting for uh, treating physicians outside an academic medical center? I think the, I think the, the it's gonna be exportable to many academic centers. So I think CAR T, CAR -T therapy will be given at academic centers but it's, gonna, it's not going to be at just one academic center. It's going to be something that's widely, widely available. And you know, while you have the cytokine released with, with the CAR-T therapy, that's perhaps more manageable than the, chronic, the acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease that you get with allogeneic transplant. So, okay, I, so I, see I, it, I see it as something really so exciting. One, one may infer from you, Dr. Bird, that uh, you would think of this to incorporate in the upfront management Absolutely, okay. you know, because you know, as right a now, maintenance or something like that. Right now, you know, right now, you know, right now, f f except for our very older patients with ALL, we're transplanting most of them, mm -hmm. and you know, this is an option. This is an option that d has much less chronic, potentially much less chronic morbidity. You know, provided you know, provided you know, we see that the remissions continue to be durable as they've been in the, from the preliminary data that can be presented at this meeting. Steve, I wonder if you could help us refine that uh, because MRD has such a role in, in the evaluation and management of kids with ALL and less so in adults. Yeah, I, I think two things just to first touch on the, uh, what I think is real excitement about these drugs. I mean, there's, there's, as we've mentioned here, four or five drugs that simply were not available five years ago and the 
immunotherapy drugs in particular are showing remarkable response rates in multiply relapsed patients. The challenge then becomes how do you move those drugs into newly diagnosed patients because and I've said this for a long time, the best way to treat relapse is to prevent it. Once you start treating patients with relapsed hematologic malignancies, you're really unlikely to cure a substantial portion of them. So when you see drugs with striking activity, it's really our job to try to get them into newly diagnosed patients in as efficient a manner as possible and find out what they add to current therapies. And I think you know, you mentioned the cytokine release syndrome that you can see uh, both with linitumumab and the uh, CAR T cells, but that is seen when patients have a significant disease burden. And it's not seen when patients are treated in a limited or minimal residual disease setting. So I think one way around those toxicities, which are, are serious and, and can be fatal, is to get the drugs given to patients in minimal residual disease status rather than in overt relapse. So I think that that's one of our challenges is how do you go from active drugs in the phase two setting in relapse patients to putting them into randomized tests in newly diagnosed patients. And one way to look at that may be to use minimal residual disease to decide which patients should be candidates in first remission for more novel or experimental therapies. And, and we know certainly from a number of very large pediatric studies that have involved really over 10,000 patients now that in pediatric ALL, minimal residual disease is the single strongest predictor of outcome. And patients who have a, and this is somewhat, uh, I think, um, self-explanatory in some ways, patients who have a great response to therapy and their disease drops below the ability to detect it at a level of one in 10,000 to one in 100,000 cells have a much better outcome than those who have higher levels of disease. I've never met a patient that didn't believe that concept. One but of the things, one of the things that you're referring to, minimal residu residual disease, is just like the, the uh, you know, pediatric regimens in adolescent adults to young adults is something really adult oncologists can learn from the, you know, the pediatricians. And you know, one of the things that's, been, that's limited, say, doing and applying minimal residual disease in, a, in adult and pediatric ALL has been lack of a standard methodology. And you know, there's some really exciting you know, abstracts at the meeting related to you know, in deep sequencing, you know, which is something that is, is very, you know, is very you know, say, reproducible you know, it, 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 when done in a when done in a central lab and can be done you know, in a CLIA you know, in a CLIA you know, fashion, and I I wonder what your thoughts are on on that in pediatric. So I think uh, John, those are great points. There's two important points here. One is um, we within the Children's Oncology Group are working closely with the adult cooperative groups and the NIH to develop standardized standardized panels so that. Uh, minimal residual disease testing, both flow cytometry and molecularly based, can be much more exportable to a larger number of labs so that you can get reproducible results. And I think the next generation sequencing technology or deep sequencing technology is very exciting. There's a lot of good data coming out from several uh, biotechnology companies. Um, that look at very high concordance with other methods of minimal residual disease detection at higher levels of minimal residual disease, and then subsets of patients who are negative by other methods or positive by these next generation sequencing technologies. And we suspect that those subsets will have a worse outcome than the ones who are negative by the deep sequencing methods, but I think that that still needs a little more work to prove it. Um, but I think that these technologies are going to move into routine clinical practice much more over the next few years. Uh, which one will win out? Will, you know, some of it will depend on the costs, and the costs of the sequencing technologies are going to be driven down, but right now are relatively expensive. And so I think um, they may not be needed for all people today because of the cost, but I suspect in five years that they will be much more cost competitive technologi technologies. Yeah. I just want to add about 
in minimal in adults, it's still not standard to do minimal residual disease. We don't know when to do it. We don't know the level, but we will have to learn how to do it. Uh, it it's becoming clear from several studies that this is in adults also an important prognostic factor. In fact, patients who are high risk by other parameters, if they are MRD negative, become a, a standard risk. In fact, can be cured without transplant. While good risk patients with, with other from other criteria and MRD positive are, are, are unfavorable patients. Now, if we're going to use these new technologies uh, early on, possibly the, the the biggest impact will be actually on those that are. Uh, MRD positive because they stay MRD positive despite the fact that we're giving them chemotherapy. So giving them more chemotherapy is not going to help. We send them to transplant, but these new techniques uh, uh, would be useful. For example, ECOG is beginning a randomized trial with blinatunumab upfront with chemotherapy compared to the same chemotherapy uh, without blinatunumab. Now in this trial, everybody is being uh, is eligible. But they're going to look specifically what happens to those that are, blind, that are MRD positive. Uh, the second example is the CAR technology. In our institution, for example, uh, a study is being planned for those who remain MRD positive. I and mean, we use a pediatric approach, so, so those are really the ones that we think are not going to do well and use the CAR technology instead of transplant, for example, or in addition to transplant in those MRD positive patients. So I, I think in adults, we will have to do MRD in every patient uh, when they're in remission. Of course, and if we want to incorporate these new agents, the immunoconjugants, immunotherapeutics, and for that matter, liposomal vincristine, we'll have to do MRD testing and see if these drugs can confer some sort of benefit, not only on MRD, but then on disease-free survival. Mike? Um, so I think the other thing that's uh, interesting about the CD19 targets is uh, they're all targeting the one molecule which can be downregulated and be removed as a target. And so, so I would anticipate that used as single agents, you're likely to run into some problems with relapse of CD19 negative B cell ALL. And then I, I think that there's actually enough differences between them that their role early on is going to be a bit more of a challenge. So Linotumumab, for example, although it's a T cell uh, drug bringing a T cell in close contact with a B cell ALL, it's nevertheless a, it's a drug. It's an antibody. You manufacture it, you give it, and you take it away, and whatever is going on goes away. A CAR T cell, once you've put it in as a biologic agent, it's got a life of its own. It's a more or less, in theory, permanent um, engraftment of a T cell which is going to permanently ablate all of your normal B cells. And so I could imagine that in the uh, setting of a first complete remission ALL, you would be happy giving a patient blinatumumab uh, or an uh, antibody drug conjugate where you might not be happy giving them a CAR T cell and inflicting a, a potentially permanent uh, immunoglobulin problem 